Okay, so how is everyone today? So last time we were talking about operations on functions, and we're still talking about operations on functions. And the way we sort of built it up last time is we were talking about make, making <coughs> analogies to numbers. So in the following sense, that numbers have the nice property that you can take two numbers and add them together and get a new number. Okay? You can combine them in that way. But there's other ways you can combine numbers, like subtract, multiply, and divide. Divide almost always works, so long, and, and it works all the time, so long as the denominator is not zero. So functions are the same. You c given two functions, you can add, subtract, multiply, or divide them, just like numbers. Except functions have this additional matter that you have to keep track of, an additional, additional piece of bookkeeping. What additional bookkeeping do you have to do when you're add, sub adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing functions? Fishing for a D word. The domain. the domain, right? So if you have two functions, f and g, then the domain of the sum function is the, is the intersection of the domains. Okay. So today we're going to talk about an operation that's completely, that, that's unique to functions and it has no counterpart among the numbers. So, this is called function composition. Let f and g be functions. The composition, so the composition of F with G is denoted as F circ. G. So that's an open circle. And pronouncing this out loud, this is F composed with G. Uh, now, F composed with, uh, that, that's, a, that's a very common and fine way to say it, but another frequent way to say it is to say circ, as in the first four letters of the word circle, uh, because when you typeset mathematics, uh, almost all mathematicians and physicists and, and like-minded people use a certain programming language to typeset mathematics, and the command to get this symbol to appear is called circ, the first four let letters of circle. <coughs> so, so circ is an operator like, you know, you could compare that to f plus g, f divide g, etc. So that now we have the following operations. We have plus, we have minus, we have multiply, we have divide, and now we have circ. So there is no counterpart for circ among the numbers. F composed with G, and it is defined as F circ G evaluate at X is F of G of X. So now, one last thing that I'll mention just once and then never again, is that if you saw this in your grade school uh, classes, your instructor at that time may have called this fog or something. And I find that to be very annoying and odious, and I will never say it again. Because that's not an O, it's the composition operator. Okay, good. Because, I mean, the problem is, is you can compose any functions. 
right? Functions don't have to have names f and g, right? If, if functions could only have names f and g, then okay, fog might be okay. Okay, so now sticking with the mental model of a function being a machine, then what this represents, this represents an assembly line, more or less. It's saying that, okay, we've got a piece of assembly line here that's running into the to the G machine. And then output comes out and then it runs into the F machine. And then output comes out. So supposing we put an X in here and X is on the assembly line, what comes out the other side right here? g of x and then the output of g of x the output of g g of x is used as the input to f so what comes out here f of g of x <clears throat> so what I'm telling you is that suppose that we have this bit of assembly line here. We've got this assembly line x becomes g of x becomes f of g of x. Supposing someone said, you know what, that's a really loud, uh, loud stuff going on. I want you to build a box around it to try and control the noise. So we build a box around it and we can no longer see the inside. We just put x's in on the left and watch f of g of x's come out on the right. Then the name of this box is f circ g. <clears throat> okay, now. This is, by way of comparison, versus, versus, suppose, suppose uh, we take these two machines, G and F, and we write, we, and we reverse their order, which is to say, let's, let's, let's make a new machine, a new assembly line, where the F machine comes first, and then the G machine. <clears throat> so supposing there's an X on the assembly line here, it goes through the F machine, what comes out and is right here? F of X is here. And then now we take the output of the F machine and use it as the input to the G machine. And then what comes out here? <clears throat> G of F of X. Okay, and then maybe the same manager or whatever says, you know, it's just it's just too loud, so let's build a box around it. Well, what is the proper name for this box? G circ F. <clears throat> so notice that they're, be, you know, they're, this one is F composed with G, F circ G, and this one is G circ F. Now let's think about this for a moment. Let's go back to numbers, something we're possibly more comfortable with, and let's take two specific numbers. How about 3 and 5? <clears throat> well, how about 3 plus 5? What's that? Eight, right? And then how about what's five plus three? Also eight. So it doesn't matter what order you do addition in. What's the name for that? The fact that it doesn't matter what order you do it in. Commutative, right? Because in your mind's eye, imagine three plus five, and now take the three and the five and move their positions to 5 plus 3 is the same. 
And the word commute means to move, which is why the fact that you can move the three and the five around, that's why that's called commutative. So notice what I did here is I commuted the machines, right? First G, then F. I commuted it to first F, then G. Will these be the same? Will these two processes, will, will these two assembly lines be the same result? And the answer is not generally. Not generally. So we're talking about a process where the order now is going to matter. So let's try and think about why it should matter. So let's imagine for a moment that we're in the business, we're all together in the business of making dolls. Okay, and that the various steps of making, making the doll is, is on an assembly line, and they're all in order, all the machines that do the various things. So now let's suppose that we have a machine that puts on left, left socks and a machine that puts on right socks, because these are fancy dolls. Okay, they, they come with socks. And, and let's imagine that we go to the store and we see one of our dolls on the, on the shelf. Now, imagine inspecting that doll. Would you be able to tell by inspection what order the left sock and right sock machines were in? No, right? You wouldn't be able to tell by looking at the doll. Can't tell. So the order of the left sock and the right sock machines does not matter. Now imagine that we have a pants machine and an underwear machine. Does the order of the pants and the underwear machines matter? <laughs> sure, right? Sure. One of, w one of them is when we're making the Ken doll, right? And the other one is when we're making the Superman doll, right? It makes a difference. It makes a difference what, what order the machines are in. Okay, so then this is, this is the, the notion of composing functions is the most important um, the most important concept in like surely in this class composing functions and more or less in all of science and manufacturing and everything I mean this is literally how all machines work and a manufacturing plant is literally literally just a machine for making more machines okay, this is the way things are and the order in which things occur really does matter so to make another example would be something like you know, if, if you're going to prepare a meal at home, the way it goes, okay, is that you prepare the meal, eat the meal, and then clean up. Notably, it's not possible to say in the morning, you know what, I'm going to prepare a meal tonight, but I'm not going to have enough time to clean it up, so I'm going to go ahead and clean it up now. Right? Right? Wouldn't that be something if you could just, if you could do that, <laughs> clean, clean it up beforehand? But that's not the way it is. Okay. <clears throat> so, suppose that we have two functions f of x is 3x plus 4, and another one g of x is x squared plus 1. In the first place, I want you to evaluate and simplify f composed with g. And then I want you to evaluate and simplify g composed with f. So we're doing f, circ, g, evaluate at x. So from the discussion, I hope that you understand that, you know, it's going to be something inside of the other something. Okay. Now the question is, is, you know, 
trying to remember which one is which. Both, we've got both possibilities here. One of them is f of g of x, and the other one is g of f of x. So the question is, is who, right here, which one is going to get the x first? Who gets the x? G gets it. And the way I remember it in my head is I just remember, ah, oh, well, when I write it like this, G is the one that's closest to the x. It's the one that's closest. It's the one that's going to get the x. So f of g of x, like so. Okay. So now, <clears throat> what f does with its argument is it takes whatever you give it and produces three argument plus four. So then this will be three argument plus four. And then whatever it is that I'm obscuring inside of that f, that's what I have to write right there. Right? If, it, if it happens to be a 12, I'll have to write a 12 right there. If it happens to be a hippopotamus, I'll have to write a hippopotamus right there. Okay, whatever it is. And presently, it's a g of x. So that means that I have to write g of x there. <clears throat> and then g of x is, is that. So that'd be 3 x squared plus 1 plus 4. So any question getting to there? And then now it's distribution and collection, things that we've done lots by now. So that'd be 3x squared plus 3 plus 4. Any question about this one? OK. So now g circ f, evaluate at x. So now in this one, who gets the x? f does. It's the closest one, so it's the one that gets the x. So g of f of x. <clears throat> well, g takes its argument, squares it, and then adds 1. So this is going to be argument squared and then plus 1. And then whatever it is that, I, that I'm putting into the g, Whatever it is that I'm obscuring with my pen, that's what I have to write right there. It's an F of X. So then F of X is 3X plus 4, so that'd be 3X plus 4. Square that. Add 1. And now it's FOIL and everything else. So the F term would be 9x squared plus, now, the o, what's going to be the O term? 12x and the I term? 12x. Right, so then we're going to have 24x's and then plus the L term is 16 and then plus that 1. So 9x squared plus 24x plus 17. Any question about this? Notably, we had two functions. We composed them in the two different orders. And we got a different result. That's not surprising. It must be this way. You could say like, well, this one right here is like uh, underwear and then pants, and this one is pants and then underwear. The result is different. Any question about this? OK. <clears throat> From a different point of view, you can make a table of values.
So the first row will be x's, and they'll go from 0 to 9. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, So the second row will be p of x. So we've got some function p, and we can plug in some x's. <coughs> that row reads 7, 6, 5, 8. Four, zero, two, one. Nine, three. I'll let you catch that for a second. Okay, the next row is q of x, <coughs> and it reads 9, 5, 6, 2. <coughs> 1, 8, 7, 3. 4, 0. Okay, so I could ask, for example, could you tell me what p of 5 is? 0. OK. So now, how about <clears throat> p plus q evaluate at x, or at um, specific place, how about 7? So p plus q evaluate at 7. <clears throat> Well, the definition of p plus q evaluated at 7, that is by definition p evaluated at 7 plus q evaluated at 7. Well, then we can look both of those up. What's p evaluated at 7? 1. One. 1 and q evaluated at 7? 3. So this would be 1 plus 3 which is 4. <clears throat> Any question about this one? <clears throat> Alternatively, I could say, well, how about <clears throat> p product q evaluated at 3? So now that's a solid dot. Well, by definition, this is p evaluated at 3, product q evaluated at 3. And then we could look both of those up. So that would be 8 multiplied by 2, which is 16. Any question about that one? <coughs> OK. Now it can be we can start getting interested. So how about p circ q evaluated at 2? So back when I, back when we were doing product for functions and I said that that's a solid dot, and if you don't know what I'm, if you don't know why I said that, then don't worry about it. This is what I meant. They look similar. So you have to be sure and write them clearly. So for this one, what, what's the argument to this evaluation that's being requested? The argument is 2. So who gets the 2? Q gets the 2. It's the one that's closest, it gets the 2. So this is P of Q of 2. Well, what is q of 2? It's 6, right? So this would be p of 6. 
And now we have to do another lookup. Well, what's P of 6? Is it really? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> that, it, that just happens sometimes. So now, to be clear, what this is saying, what, you know, this is sort of in language what's happening here. You could write it. But if you wanted to draw, make a drawing, or if you wanted to sort of understand it in terms of machines, what's happening is that we've got an input. We're giving it to the Q machine, which produces its output. And we use that output as input to the P machine. And it does its thing. All right, so then if if we give a 2 as input to the Q machine, what comes out? A 6. And then if we give that 6 as input to the P machine, what comes out? A 2. It's just sort of cute. It's just a coincidence that that two goes in and comes back out. Right, you can kind of imagine that if you put a box around this so that you couldn't see what was happening. This this would be the P cert Q machine. Uh, and if you gave it a two, right, two goes in and maybe you hear all this whirring and drilling like and saws and then you put the two in and then two comes out on the other side. <laughs> Nothing happened. Okay, four. Uh, how about Q circ P evaluate at nine? Okay, so who gets the 9? P gets the 9. So this would be Q of P of 9. Now you look up P of 9, that's 3. So that would be Q of 3. And then you look up Q of 3, and that's a, uh, a 6. A 6? No. Q of 3 is a 2. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, fine. Any question about this one? <clears throat> OK. Now here's something that might be slightly puzzling until you think about it. So how about, how about um, P circ P evaluated at 7? You might look at that and say, wow, can you even, is that even legal? <laughs> can you do that? And the answer is, sure, right? You could have two copies of the P machine and put them in a row. An example in real life where this occurs all the time is that if you ever paint a wall, well, the general procedure for painting a wall is you paint it once, you let it get dry, and you paint it again. That's what makes it look good. So you gotta, you got to put the wall through the painting machine twice. So that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. OK. So this would be P of P of 7. <clears throat> well, you look up P of 7. That's a 1. So that'd be P of 1. And then you look up P of 1, and that's a 6. Any question about that? Okay. Here's another one that might be slightly surprising until you think about it. How about Q circ Q circ P circ Q evaluated at 8? Wow, 
Wow. <laughs> so this would be like an assembly line with four machines in it. So if we were to draw it, it would look like this. So it would look like this. And now, reading left to right, this one, that one, that one, that one. What are the machines? Q. Then. So this one would be Q. What's this one? Not Q. This one is Q. What's this one? P, and then Q, and then Q. Now notably, when you're reading them here, they're in this order, but when you're reading them here, they're in reversed order. Because what's happening is that when you look at this, when you look at this evaluation, 8 is the argument. Who's going to get the 8? Q. Q is. This 8 goes to that Q whose output goes to that P, whose output goes to that Q, whose output goes to the last Q. So when you're reading them, when, you're, when you've written it like this, they occur in right to left order. First that one, then that one, then that one, then that one. But when you're drawing it, it's, re it's left to right order. Okay, so let's, let's see if we can do it in the machine here. So we put an eight into the Q machine. What comes out? A four. And then we put a four into the P machine. And what comes out? Four. A four. And then we put that four into the Q machine. What comes out? One. A one. And then we put that one into the Q machine. And what comes out? Five. Five. Interesting. <clears throat> Any question about this? So now let's see how to evaluate it here. And this is lots and lots of parentheses. OK. So it'll be Q, really big parentheses, of Q, slightly less big parentheses, of P, slightly less big parentheses, of Q, of 8. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? So now you can probably see why it's nice to use the circ notation <laughs> rather than that craziness. So the first thing you ask, well, what's Q of 8? It's 4. So that would be Q, big parentheses, Q, slightly less big parentheses, of P, slightly less big, of 4. And then that's Q, big parentheses, of Q, slightly less big parentheses. And P of 4 is 4, like so. And then Q of 4 is 1. So this would be Q of 1. So that would be 5. Lovely. Any question about this? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so it's really no exaggeration to say that the concept of a function and the analogy to it being a machine that accepts inputs and outputs and the fact that functions can be composed and the analogy to putting machines in order in an assembly line is of fundamental importance in mathematics and science and everything else. Okay, so maybe just as another example, uh, many of you are going to have or will soon take a biology course. And in biology, you've got to use a compound microscope. 
at least once. You can't get through a biology lab anyway without using a compound microscope at least once. So they're called compound microscopes because two lenses are being composed, right? There's, there's at least two lenses on every compound microscope. There's the objective lens, the one that usually can be rotated and it's immediately above the stage that holds the specimen. And you can select among a few magnifications. And then the eyepiece usually has a fixed magnification like 10. So suppose that we have the objective lens set to the 30 times magnification and that the eyepiece has 10 times magnification. Well, what's the total magnification then? Three hundred, right? Three hundred, because what's happening is that you've got you've got a photon source, and then it passes through the stage. You know these photons go this way, and then it passes through the thirty x objective lens. so 30 times, it spreads the photons out. So they get spread out. So they're far more spread out. And then it goes through another lens. So these photons don't make it. They get spread out too far. This is a 10 times lens. And these get spread out like this. So the total spreading here is 300 times. So you can see the little critters that are crawling around in your cheek <laughs> or whatever it is that you do in biology. <laughs> okay. First the 1, first the 30, then the 10. Terrific. Any question about this? <clears throat> so now, for the rest of the day, is opposite day. So this is section 3.5. transformations of functions. So now I have to explain why we're going to call this opposite day. So I'll explain it in the following way. <clears throat> so I want you to imagine that that um, we're in a blank universe and that the only thing that you can see is this pencil here and this piece of paper. So you can't see the desk or the other stuff around us like this screen or my hands or anything like that. So you can't see anything but the, but the pencil and the paper. So now I'm going to make the pencil move up. Are you ready? See my pencil moving up? To which you might object and say, well, actually, it appears to me that the paper moved down. <laughs> to which I'll have to respond that, what's the difference? If that's the only two things we can see, then, yeah, we can make the pencil move up by, by moving the, the page down. Alternatively, would you like to see my pencil move to the right? <laughs> see it see it doing its thing so uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take functions that we know like for example the standard parabola imagine the standard parabola in your mind's eye you might say that's a nice parabola I like it but you know what I would like it to be a little bit further to the right well you can achieve this in two ways you could actually pick up the parabola and move it to the right or or you could move the coordinate system that is underneath it to the left. And the same result is achieved in either way. Or to put it in sort of a, a, a different, more comical way, you know, there's all those shows that are like uh, Love It or Listed and, and all the let's, let's do a renovation on my house show. You know what I'm talking about. 
and then someone could walk in and say, you know what, I like this kitchen island, I like it, but really I would like it for it, for it to be a foot and a half to the left. And then normally you see someone say, oh, but it's going to cost so much, and then someone, th then the person says, oh, but I just have to have it, and then they, they do it, right? Well, you could imagine a slightly different version of that show where someone comes in, okay, and holds the kitchen down, the kitchen island down, and then a few other people come and drag the whole house, just, <laughs> just pull the whole house over. Same, same, same thing, right? Same effect. So, what we're going to do, the mathematical point of view to move functions around and to make them change their shape, Rather than, moving the, rather than moving the plot of the object, rather than moving the object, we're going to move the coordinate system. And if you want an object to move to the right, then how do you move the coordinate system? To the left. Which is why I said today is going to be opposite day. Okay, because it's going to feel a little opposite until you get the... the, the the hand, a handle on the idea. So, horizontal shift. Uh, a horizontal shift of C units. Is given by the transformation X transforms to X minus C. <clears throat> so let's see what this means. So here's the standard parabola. Y is x squared. And what we're going to do is we're going to move the standard parabola to the right a little bit. So then, move the standard parabola to the right. <clears throat> so now, what I'd like for you to observe is that in, in the transition from here to here, you could construe this as the plot moved right by 3. Okay. Well, the red stuff the parabola moved right three units. Because, you know, you could track, for example, this one point, this green point. That green point became this green point. So the green point moved three to the right. Alternatively, you could view this as saying something about the coordinate system. How did the coordinate system move? The coordinate system moved left three. <clears throat> so now here's the question I want you to answer. So here's the, here's the blank to fill in. So this one has a plot and an equation. And this one just has a plot. What's the equation?
quiet. So, so did the plot move up and down at all? No. So that means that the y's aren't going to change. So it's still going to be y equal. Now, did the plot move left and right? It did. So that means the x is going to change. So that means that we're going to have to write something in here squared. And my question to you is, is so x changes to what? x minus 3. Now first let's let's point out your fears for a moment in, in case you have <laughs> your uncertainty in case you haven't noticed it. So now the object the red thing the parabola move to the right 3. So why are we subtracting 3? Because subtracting 3 that kind of feels like that kind of seems like something's moving to the left. So if the parabola is moving to the right by 3, why are we subtracting? So why? Because something did move left. What moved left? The coordinate system. So what I'm telling you is that the way this is achieved is, yeah, you could pick up the parabola and move it over. But that's not what we actually did. That's not the, I mean, you could, you could think of it like that. But here's a more fruitful way to think of it, is I'm going to take the parabola and pin it down. So I'm, I, it's stuck now, because I'm holding it there. I'm going to take the coordinate system, I'm going to grab it, and pull it to the left by 3. So if I pull the coordinate system to the left by 3, that's what the picture looks like. Now, even if you're still not convinced, even if you're still not convinced, ignore the picture for a moment. For this equation, what, we, what x value would we need to plug in so that y would be 3, uh, so that y would be 0? You need to plug in 3. Where is y 0? That x is 3. Okay, let's try another one. Sometimes it helps just to do a, a whole bunch of examples. So now let's consider uh, the absolute value function. So what's the characteristic shape of the absolute value function? It's a V, right? So it'll look like this. more or less. So now suppose So now, how did the plot move? It moved left. How much? So the plot went left 4. Alternatively, how did the coordinate system move? Right 4. So now my question to you is, is what is going to be the equation for the graph that generates this plot? What will it be? Yeah, it'll be y is absolute of something. Y is absolute of x plus 4. 
because what we're doing is we're moving the coordinate system we're moving the x's to the right pin down that absolute value grab the x's pull them to the right four units and that's what you'll see so what we're going to do we'll con we're going to continue talking about this next time but it's going to get more varied so here, here's another thing to think about before Friday uh, in, a, in a physical example. So, so I have a, one of my children is a five-year-old daughter. So, so in the, she's, she's small by virtue of being five, but she's also like in the 17th percentile for height, so she's small even among her colleagues. So when, <laughs> when we go to, uh, you know, somewhere like Six Flags, you know, all the rides say, you have to be this tall. Well, it's not going to happen for her, probably. <laughs> to, to most of the rides, it's not going to happen. So if I was magical, then I could fix it. One of the ways I could fix it is just stretch her out, right? Just and then fixed. But if I was magical, you know, then I would probably be more likely to take the parent point of view and say, there's nothing wrong with her. She's perfect. There's something wrong with this theme park. And then what would I do? I wouldn't change her. What would I do? Shrink the whole theme park, right? Okay, perfect. Now the theme park fits. So when we want to make objects taller, when we want to make parabolas taller, we're not going to make them taller. What are we going to do? We're going to make the coordinate system shorter. And that's how we'll achieve the effect. Okay, have a nice Wednesday.